Welcome to the Yuzima Health and Wellness Podcast. All right, Dr. Terrell Sanders, you're all the way in Ghana, right? And um, finally, nice to meet you. Our cousin, my cousin, uh, good cousin, put us in uh, touch. And now I understand that was your classmate from the University of Georgia, right? In Athens. Go yeah, Bulldogs. Bulldogs, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mr. Ger- we go like way back uh, uh-huh. to the 2000s. All right. So tell me where you're from. So uh, born and raised in uh, this town called Mullen, South Carolina. Um, mm-hmm. It's about an hour from uh, Myrtle Beach and the Columbia area, but along the I-95 corridor. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, that's where I was born and raised. <laughs> and describe that town to me. So it's, it's, it's primarily an agricultural um, mm-hmm. agriculture area. Like my family's background, my grandfather on my mother's side uh, was a sharecropper. And so mm-hmm. a lot of that area is farmland and uh, timber, what we would call it the country or mm-hmm part for people who don't uh understand where the sticks are we, we grew up in the sticks you grew up uh, in the sticks yeah in, in the sticks did my uh, cousin ever tell you where my grandmother's house was i'm not was that in Renz or tom so we're in a smaller community even past Renz. i mean Renz is big i mean we were in the sticks as well so, okay. so uh, like the third dirt road past the light off of 56 before you get to a town called uh, Crossing Green. That's how, how do you know wow. where you live? You know what I'm saying? So I understand when you say you lived in the sticks. So oh, what yeah. did your parents do? So my, um, my mom and dad, they both worked in factories. And mm-hmm. so my dad was a forklift operator uh, for this company called International Paper. Uh, Mm-hmm. And he was there up until around the early 2000s when I guess the economy, the first crashed and stuff kind of got outsourced to overseas. Uh-huh. Uh, and my mom worked for this lighting company in a factory making uh, light bulbs mm-hmm. uh, called Supreme Lighting and was kind of in a similar, similar situation. She had worked there for most of her adult life mm-hmm. uh, when I was a kid up until around the 99. Uh, 2000 time frame when that company also got sold overseas and so um, they went through a period where you know went back uh, just different temporary factory jobs just to try to you know make ends meet but uh, in that you know same type of country rural environment um, with the you know the 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 few jobs that were available um, they were either industrial or mostly agricultural Correct. Yeah. So my grandmother worked for um, for a uh, lawn mowing company in town, Ropers. Okay. So I understand that. And then uh, before my mother went to Georgia Southern, she worked actually at the there was a sewing factory in town. So I know about you know the factories uh, really sustaining our, our small communities. Um, and then of course when they close, that means that our families have to travel further for to make you know make their make our lives you know, what they were. Um, and so that, that creates a hardship, a period of hardship. So I can totally relate. Um, and then you went to UGA. So all of that was yeah. saying you finished high school. What high school? Give a shout out to your high school. All of that. So I went to Mullins High School, class of 2000. So uh, Maybe. Um, <laughs> yeah, we were the auctioneers, go ox. <laughs> all right. And uh, also give a shout out to your parents. What are their names? Oh, yeah, yeah. Mom and dad, uh, Clifton Foxworth, and then Mary Mary Ann Fosworth, yeah, they uh, they definitely like you know none of us get to where we are by ourselves, and so right. parents, family started it, mentorship along the way, but you know everybody, the whole entire village and tribe kind of all helped me get to this point. Um, and then you uh, so you are you you have siblings? Yeah, I'm the oldest of uh, five. I'm the oldest Beautiful. of five siblings. Okay, and then you were you went to UGA. Uh, did you did they go to college? So yeah, so my siblings, uh, we all kind of did different stuff, but uh, everybody went to school. That's beautiful. Um, yeah, and I think kind of just starting that, our parents didn't go to college, but we kind of want to start that trend and make that the new family tradition. So that's beautiful. You know, my my siblings have um, their own kids, so they all have kids. I don't have any kids, mm-hmm. but that's kind of what we're trying to impress upon them is just you know the importance of getting education now. COVID kind of threw a wrench in a lot of schooling with the whole 
homeschooling aspect, yes. but just trying to instill in them, you know, the importance of education and how it can open doors uh, and plant that seed in them early. Cause you know, we didn't have that, uh -huh. but kind of get them with, you know, our, and kind of knowing our path uh -huh. and how we had it, uh, just trying to, you know, guide the way for them as they kind of right. get towards that age. So. Okay. And then did they, uh, so who went to UGA? Just you or what, what was the trend? What's the it's family? Just me. So uh, with, with us being South Carolinians, uh, they all stay back in South Carolina to go to school. Um, okay. And I was the only one that uh, ventured off uh, the, the furthest and, and I keep getting further. Um, <laughs> you're, you're all the way in Ghana now. <laughs> Now I'm in Africa, exactly, all the way in Ghana. So, um, but yeah, I, I was, you know, kind of, kind of the first to kind of make that path, and ho hopefully not the last, but, uh, but, but we shall see. <laughs> okay, okay. Let me ask you this: so, so UGA, what was your major? So while I was at Georgia, uh, initially I was a computer science um, and genetics, made double major, um, dropped the computer science, and completed. And just finished with genetics okay because uh, i always knew i wanted to be you know or at an early age i knew i wanted to pursue medicine okay um, computer science was kind of like uh i think around that time the tech buzz was was booming it was a good hobby and so i was like oh yeah i can you know i know i'm doing some type of biology or advanced science um but then the computer science part i'm like you know this is a, a cool hobby so let me try to pursue that as well okay. but um I was like, yeah, yeah this is <laughs> it's more than just a hobby. This is like a serious major. <laughs> in all right. So uh, I gracefully bought out of that and uh -huh. just finished with my genetics degree. Um, but yeah, it, uh, you know, set the way for getting out all of the prerequisites that I would need to kind of pursue medicine. So, I, you know, I think that that was a, a good choice and a good fit for me. Genetics. So you did the fruit flies. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Drosophila. Drosophila oh. Yep. Oh my Fruit goodness. Flies, bacteria, all that stuff. Uh, you all that. And, <laughs> yeah, oh. and it's interesting because uh what got you know, I think just the curiosity mm -hmm. always kind of drew me to sciences. But mm -hmm. then with genetics, it's like, well, what makes you you, you know, the whole nature versus nurture thing. And uh -huh. so genetics was always one of those aspects of science. Um just from a theoretical level and even just you know just in like why you know you get your genes from your mom and your dad but why do some of us look more like one parent or the other so genetics was always one of those biological things that just just kind of fascinated me so um I pursued it in 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 in, in practice mm -hmm. it's different <laughs> like yeah, you it's said good. a lot more fruit flies and people <laughs> like oh your genetics you're cloning stuff like nah we do more stuff with bacteria and fruit right. flies than anything else so That's like y'all don't need to worry about getting cloned <laughs> <laughs> let me ask you this did you know were, were you prepared from your rural high school to go to a competitive university setting or did you have to what or have the adjustments to make um I, I definitely felt prepared but then also still had to make a lot of adjustments mm -hmm. um uh, and a lot of the adjustments were just more kind of being on my own and uh the fine it's like balancing the financial and the academic responsibilities okay. um we're in high school and growing up through school for the most part your your family my parents took care of the financial and i just had to focus on being a student mm -hmm. um unlike a lot of my peers folks were like oh yeah i never had to study in high school i just kind of breezed by like i studied so i i fortunately i had a good work ethic uh from mm -hmm. high school that carried over in college mm -hmm. but just to kind of balance of trying to um, make ends meet to, you know, the, to make, make, make up for what my family wasn't able to provide financially. I worked all uh -huh. throughout college. Okay. Uh, so between working, trying to be full-time, eventually full-time became part-time, less than half-time um, okay. and trying to maintain some type of a social life uh, right. in college. Right. So just kind of with all of those competing things and trying to balance those as a young adult, um, that was kind of, I think, my biggest, my biggest struggle or hurdle with, with college and an advanced degree. Um, and I was like, the one thing that was different as a kid or as a high school is like, 
you know, I worked to help my parents, but I didn't have to work to sustain myself. Right. Whereas in college, I was working to kind of sustain myself as well as trying to focus and be a good student. Um, so you chose, and that's because you chose to go to an out-of-state school. Exactly. And like, right. a, and with me, in hindsight, uh, knowing what I know now, yes. um, you know, maybe taking some time to, and I, and I did get some scholarships, but just not enough. And it's like, oh, um, mm-hmm. this will help me get through. And just not really realizing, oh, like, college is expensive. And especially when you're out of state, mm-hmm. just kind of what what all of that, um, uh, from a mm-hmm. financial standpoint, how much of a burden that can be if you don't have a good plan or nobody to kind of walk you through. It's right. like, getting in is just the first step. But then it's like, now you have room and board. Uh, in addition to tuition, then you right. have to worry about, am I not going to be on the meal plan or not? Like, how am I going to eat? Right. Uh, so, you know, all of those competing things that as a kid in high school or a kid going, growing up, you don't have to worry about that. Like, you don't pay for your own books. You, you, you Your mom and dad provide room and board. <laughs> like, right. you, you get free meals. <laughs> you might do that school for free. And so uh, when you're having to do that on your own, mm-hmm. at least like as a first generation college grad uh that that was like a you know a a rough learning curve but you know I got through it and I think it made me better but it's one of those things where like I struggle hopefully so my nieces and nephews and maybe and even my kids when I have kids don't have to go through those same struggles you know so Um, let's talk about um you know the path to you graduate you know you struggle you get through um the school this period at UGA um, and, and thumbs up, thumbs down. Would you say UJ was supportive of, of you as a black male? Um, or you found mentorship so that you knew that you could be su- a successful graduate at UGA? So that, so yeah, that, that part I would say was tough. Um, and a lot of it was just due to the lack of representation. There, there weren't other than directly from Africa, uh, my, uh, professors that were in the genetics department yeah there weren't any african-american males like right. like me that were in the genetics department and so the few mentors i had were great uh but it still was like a disconnect because you know looking at it through their lens and their perspective i'm like you know academics aside the the issues and things that i'm struggling with as a black male they couldn't relate to Right, um, right. From a mentorship perspective, because again, the academics only gets you so far. Uh, having connections and who you know, and having your mentor or advisor, you know, um, have being able to um, relate to where you're coming from, I think goes a long way in that mentor mentee relationship and also opening doors for you. And mm-hmm. as an African American male, that there wasn't much representation at all. So my so mentors how- were great. They wrote great recommendation letters for, for what I wanted to do, but no one that I could talk to like, hey, what's it like to, to be a black doctor? Uh-huh. Um, or how do I get to that level? I, fortunately, I had older fraternity brothers uh, yeah. that I had met uh, throughout my time at University of Georgia. And at so the time, uh, yeah, I pledged uh, uh, or was initiated Phi Beta Sigma. Okay. And older fraternity brothers I had met uh, had gone through that similar route. So I didn't meet anybody in my department Uh as a genetics uh, major that kind of walked me through or showed me the path. But I did have guidance and mentorship from those fraternity brothers that could kind of show them the way. But but it's different from having a faculty advisor that can relate to you. Like, these are the classes you need to take. This is what you need to do to to put yourself out there from a, you know, once you get the academics and stuff, these are the types of ex- extracurriculars you need. Right. These are the types of social things that you need. Um, your resume building. Your exactly, resume. exactly. So you, so you knew that your path was going to be medicine. You never wavered on that after you dropped your computer science. And then yeah. you said, okay, I'm going to do genetics and then I'm going to apply to medical school. Yes. So you get so through gen- mm-hmm. Got through genetics. Uh, um, and then, you know, around junior year, that's when you put in your, you know, you start studying for the medical college admissions test. Um, I was late to the whole pre-med, uh, again, not having the right people to point me right. in that, that uh, on that path. 
And so I was about a year delayed. And so going into my senior year, I didn't take the MCAT until actually my senior year. Um, right. right. MCA was kind of like average at that time. Mm-hmm. Uh, and my MCAT score was average. And so mm-hmm. at that mm-hmm. time, the advisor that was kind of over pre-med was like, are you sure you want to do this as a career? It's like, you may want to rethink this. And I was like, I'm, I'm pretty sure. I've been sure since I was a kid. Mm-hmm. I just didn't know the how. You, let, like, me, I know let, let, me, I let me stop you mm-hmm. there because this is an important point because I got stopped on that path too. So once mm-hmm. they look at your GPA and once they looked at your 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 trajectory through the through the school, not really knowing everything that you had to deal with to even get said GPA, right? Exactly. Then they tell you, well, maybe you. I think what, what was the term she said? Um, you may not have the critical skills necessary, critical thinking skills necessary mm-hmm. to be a doctor. I mean, like she wrote me off based on my ability to do complex analysis. Okay, yeah. and I don't know too many people that can do complex analysis. I've done Cal 1, 2, 3, and 4, differential equations. Did I do differential equations? I think I didn't do differential equations. I, um, so don't, don't quote me on that one. But the, the advanced math, you know, and complex analysis got me. Whoo, that was rough. But she wrote me off to being a doctor based on that grade. Yeah. <laughs> so you're even told, are you sure you want to do this based on... That's just amazing to me. I'm sorry. Yeah. And that's and that, and that's where I think the whole kind of like representation matters. I think because knowing that a lot of our, you know, the people who paved the way for us didn't have the most direct route. And it's like, mm-hmm. you know, we had to fight and, and, and struggle and scrap to get to where we are. But yet they know that, okay, if I can do it, you can do it. And like you said, you're you're more than just a GPA and a Mm-hmm. one bad like one bad grade or one bad class uh or even one great admissions test or one poor admissions test mm-hmm. uh, i feel like with the mentors that i've had that were african-american they definitely it was a more holistic approach they looked right. at me as the student me as the person and the potential whereas right. I think with that advisor and it sounds like your advisor as well they just see the the snapshot um, right. which you know, and i get that you know, as I've progressed and I've sat on admissions committees, uh, I've been on the other side of that. I, I get the importance of mm-hmm. it's a snapshot, but it does kind of tell a story. But I would take it a step further. And like you said, I want the whole story and not right. just the academics. Um, right. There is a reason why like bedside manner accounts for so much. <laughs> and mm-hmm. your patients will tell you, like my doctor, you know, they they don't necessarily, they, they just assume that you're a doctor, so everybody's smart, but it's like, right. you don't have to be the smartest doctor uh, to exactly. have the best for your patients, but you have to be, you know, you should be empathetic and the most compassionate, right. um, the most humanistic. And I think that's the piece that a lot of really bright, intelligent, smart learners, right. they're great, they can, they can score well on the tests, have high IQ, uh-huh. but they call it that, that disconnect where they don't necessarily connect on the human level. Correct. And they can't talk to patients. They can't teach patients. It's like, right. if you can't break it down for a five-year-old to know, then it's like, are you really a good teacher? Are, are you able to mm-hmm. help your patient now take ownership and accountability for their, their medical condition if you can't break it down so that they understand? Right. They, they should at least leave that interaction feeling a little bit more empowered about their own health and that they can help themselves and their family versus yeah, my doctor just talked over my head the whole time. Mm-hmm. Um, or belittled that's me. That's what so. I get from my family. And yeah. they're always- <laughs> <laughs> listen, so so after you, uh, so you so you ignore this mentor and you say, listen, I want to be a doctor. I've known I want to be a doctor and I'm going to do this. You find your mm-hmm. mentorships with your bras and then you, so then what happens? You put your application on the table? So put my uh, initial application on the table. Um, didn't get, uh, I think I applied to about, because at this point too, I'm still working. I graduated, but I'm, uh, I'm working like three jobs, uh, working at a research lab, working at a Murphy's gas station, and I worked at Campus Catering as, wow. <laughs> as Jurassic Outlet. So kind of working three jobs, but I have a genetics degree. Uh-huh. And, but it's like, you know, the, the degree is just one small part of it. Mm-hmm. Um, but submitted my initial application. Um, I knew my, my GPA was like 3.3. Mm-hmm. 3.33 or something like that 
Um, Good. But, you know, like medical school is like, you know, you got to be like a rock three, five or higher. Yeah, uh, MCAT was like, the yeah. MCAT. That MCAT got you? Yeah, the, the, the MCAT got me. The MCAT got me. The first, <laughs> you can't study for the MCAT working three jobs. I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, and, and, and with no prep class, no nothing. Ah, you uh, got to do it. And so that didn't go well, but I'm working. And um, at this point now, I'm getting a little bit more background knowledge. One of my mentors, like, so he wasn't in the medical field, but again, an older frat brother, he's the one who kind of put me on the deal route path. And, right. um, and then through my own work, I was like, okay, I need to look into a post-bac, post-baccalaureate okay. program so uh -huh. that I can show that I can do the work in medical. You know, a lot of the feedback that I got was, you know, your GPA, um, between that and your scores, uh -huh. we're not sure how you would do. So I'm like, okay, this is feedback that I can, I can at least work on. And they're right. giving me, they're giving me targets and tasks that I can achieve. If they're like, your GPA is off, well, I can do a program to help me get my right. GPA. I knew the MCAT, I needed to get those scores up. So, um, and so worked for about two and a half years. Uh, eventually I uh, quit the other two jobs and just focused on my research lab job. Um, I got the acceptance into graduate school. Okay. So that was around 2008. Uh -huh. um, so from 2000, yeah, 2008 to 2010, I was in Atlanta and at the Georgia campus of the Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine. Okay, so, so you researched a post bac program and you yeah. did that at the Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine. What, was it a general science year? So it was a, a master of science in bio, biomedical sciences. Oh, and it was okay. a non-thesis, non but capstone-based mm -hmm. uh, curriculum. And then, so you did that to get the GPA up and then allow yourself time to study for the MCAT? Exactly. Okay. And so it was during that period. So um, GPA got brought up, uh, okay. also was working. <laughs> uh, but you know, with graduate school, the, the, it's, a, it's a lot more, I guess, not flexibility per se, but you do have a little bit more time. Okay. And so um, was able to, to save up and take i think i took princeton review so i took yes. princeton review well, that's, not also, that's not cheap that's not cheap it's not and then um exam crackers i bought like some of the self uh self-learning right. study tests and questions right uh, on the, the exam cracker so i kind of did a mixture of independent independent study and um, a course and and a guided uh, structure right. class right. Yes, uh, i mm -hmm. think i brought my score like 20 points yes you can do it mm -hmm. that was yeah and as opposed to just like learning my textbooks, relearning no, the prerequisites, it's like, you know, need, like you need to learn the test. Uh, mm -hmm. And and so that helped. So let between, me just repeat that. You have to learn to take the test. And so when, exactly. the, when you hear things like, oh, well, maybe you, you're not qualified to be a doctor. All you need to do was sit down and say, OK, I need to learn how to take the intrinsic test. And that does not require you rereading all your genetics and biology books. You actually need to learn how to take the test by going to this business that we have called, you know, Kaplan Test Review and Princeton exactly. Test Review. So I was in graduate school too. And I say, okay, I'm taking a review class. And I go in there like, here are all the smart people. <laughs> you know, they learning to take the test. And that's yeah. what I did. And, and yeah. so that's what they don't tell you. They don't say, well, you know what? Go take a review class on how to take the test to get into medical school. They don't tell you that. And I think that starts early on, uh, Doc, you brought up a good point because I, similar thing with the SAT, like I, I did okay. Like, yep. I, and in hindsight, probably could have did way better. Like mm -hmm. my friends that did, it's like, they all did prep classes. And I was like, why are you doing SAT prep? You don't need to do SAT prep, you just you take do. the test. <laughs> but if, yeah, but if you don't, you know, mm -hmm. um, if you don't do well at standardized tests, then it's like having a kind of structured curriculum to kind of help you not psych yourself out yes. and to know how to take the test and to pace mm -hmm. yourself, you know, just like test taking strategy because it's, it's different from like the the academic type test that you get. So right, right, right. Um, all different. of those things from like 2008 to 2010, I think set me up to get into medical school. And so you um, applied to medical school after, so they took you from undergrad, you finished when? So undergrad, I finished in 2005. 2005, and you get into medical school for what year? 
uh, and I got into medical school in 2010. So it was like so about you, a five you, year gap. You kept working at it for five years and you applied yeah. to medical school how many times? So I applied to medical school twice. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And see, that's what people don't understand. And uh -huh. then I did the uh, master's program in between to try to okay. get my yeah. So when I talk to, talk to uh, students about their, your, their plan, and when they think that they don't, they don't appreciate the time that goes by when you either delay studying for the MCAT or delay, uh, um, you know, you have to delay because you get a graduate degree, then you have to apply on the next cycle. So really it's a five-year plan. Once you did get in UGA the first year, you had to literally make a five-year plan to get into medical school for the, yeah. for the, you know, for the cycle. You see what I'm saying? And I yeah. think that people underestimate that. They think, oh, well, I'll just put it off. I'll take the MCAT later. And then when they don't get a good score, put their application together and get denied, then they don't realize, no, you needed to have made a five-year plan. And oftentimes that does include going to get a master's degree or um, some type of meaningful, more, more than not an academic type of um, uh, activity. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. just working as a scribe doesn't get you competitive, uh, make your application competitive for medical school. So exactly. I think, and I've sat on the same type, sat on admissions committees too, and looked at, you know, what we was described as our successful applicant. Yeah. Um, so this is, this is important for our uh, black students to, to understand. And so, you know, when I hear the media say things like, you know, decrease in numbers or these reporting about how do we get the numbers? We get the numbers by giving our youth um, the right information. And they also have to receive it from the people who've actually said, no, that's not gonna work. And this is what you need to do. Uh, so I think that's, I'm, I appreciate your honesty and, and, and this is important because I tell people, no, I took the MCAT twice and I applied to medical school twice and I got a master's degree after leaving college for the same reasons, MCAT and GPA scores need to be brought up. Um, so you go to medical school where? So uh, after finishing uh, graduate school and while I was in grad school, I got commissioned as in, as a Navy officer. Uh, oh, okay. That's yeah. when you took me. Okay. So, mm -hmm. And so that's where I kind of find out about the, the health professional scholarship program. And so the armed forces offers that separately from their uh, uniform services, university uh, okay. uses. Right. Um, so it's like you can go to uses and get accepted there and you're active duty in medical school, nursing school or, or whatever, or the, the HPSP uh, health profession scholarship. Hold on. At this point, I left home in 2000 to go to school uh, mm -hmm. and I never looked back. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. And so at this point, it's 2010 when I'm enrolling, uh, when I'm matriculated into the University of South Carolina School of Medicine. Wonderful. And so kind of being away from, even though it's Georgia, you know, it's, it's close, but it still was like a five and a half hour drive from my right. home. Mm -hmm. um, so when I'm in Columbia, uh, that's mm -hmm. only an hour. Oh, that's home. nice. And so, uh -huh. you know, yeah. So I got to be a lot closer to family. Um, and then and during that time, you know, we, we had lost. I feel like loss is always going to be there, uh, but being just having that um, freedom and that peace of mind, knowing that if something did happen, a family emergency, I'm only an hour away. Correct. Versus, um, five. You know, five hours away, five and a half hours, and mm -hmm. having all that stress on your mind. Um, and when I wasn't able to make it down to see them, they were able to make it up to Columbia to see me. So Beautiful. And they were proud. They were very proud of their son, right? <laughs> they got a doctor in the house. Yeah. So although medical school was rough, uh, a lot of the same, and it was definitely more rigorous than undergrad, a lot of the same issues and things that I struggled with uh, being on my own as an undergrad, I didn't have to worry about mm -hmm. uh, at, as a medical student because family's there, mm -hmm. that support system and network is there. If it's like, oh, you need food, we'll bring something up. You know? <laughs> You don't have to worry about where your next meal was going to come from. Never did. Uh, and then I also had a, yeah, one of our really close friends also stayed with me. So it's kind of like having good supportive roommates, her and a cousin. We all had a, you know, an apartment together. So it's like, um, you know, just not 
it's like, yeah, I'm the only one that's going to school and taking these classes, but it's like, I had a good network uh, to decompress and, you know, kind of help me from a holistic standpoint when I didn't have to worry about the stress of being a medical student and, a, right. and an aspiring doctor. So, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that, that was 2000 to 2010 to 2014. Okay, and you um, took out the military scholarship, the um, and and, the, and that's the health. Tell me the name of the scholarship specifically. It's, uh, it's called the Armed Forces Health Professionals Scholarship mm -hmm. Program, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. at least the Navy offers it for physicians, mm -hmm. nurses, dentists. Um, I think the Army and the Air Force extend theirs to pharmacists, right? Mm -hmm. um, as well. And so you got that when you were in, at Pecan in graduate school, you were able to, uh, but did you know, did you take out the, the scholarship was offered once you got into medical school? So you had the, I had to apply for them concurrently. And so, oh, okay. yeah, uh, prior to, and so, and I think afterwards they, they stopped that and said that you actually had to have an acceptance. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, got you. Mine even, I think got held up a little bit. I got commissioned, but I don't think my scholarship I didn't get my scholarship until my second year of medical school, not mm -hmm. fully, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. but because of the time, timing of when I, when I got commissioned and mm -hmm. uh, when that commissioning got officially approved and the paperwork went through. Yes. Um, but, but yeah, that, that's how in um, perfect timing wise it works. You get accepted first, you're able to apply to the scholarship in time for the funding to be ready for it to start paying for all four years of school. Paying for all four years of school. Yeah, like I got mine or found out I got it right around the time that I graduated from graduate school back in May. Okay. And so the funding cycle had already passed because I would have been starting school mm -hmm. that August. Right. So the first year I ended up taking out some loans um, mm -hmm. just to kind of, cause I'm like, they're like the scholarship is coming, you're commissioned, but it's like, you just don't have the funding or the money yet. Uh -huh. um, that, I think they didn't get kicked in until going the summer going into my second year of medical school. And then okay. it was like, at that point, all tuitions covered, uh, got reimbursed for books, got a small living stipend. So that also too, cost of living was cheaper in South Carolina. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and the living stipend helped. Still had to take out some money to, to live. Right. Um, but you didn't have to different. work three jobs, which is not possible yeah. in medical school. And, and that, that's the one thing that, you know, the struggles that I went through for undergrad taught me is like, it's full time for a reason. You, you, what's that saying? You can't serve two masters. So it's like you can't <laughs> be a full time steward and a full time employee at the same time. You're not. No, you're not. You have to get at it and get it done. It's competitive. Um, so after uh, medical school, you then do a residency uh, in internal yeah. medicine, right? Yeah. So at this point, um, I graduate medical school. Um, I do the military match. Uh, mm -hmm. I went on a few civilian. Uh, interview mm -hmm. but uh with the military system they're like on our scholarship you you know unless we give you permission you're going to be doing your residency at one of our military locations right and mm -hmm. so at that time uh, and i think even till this day they had three uh for the specialty that i chose so mm -hmm. i chose internal medicine uh, as a categor categorical resident mm -hmm. and so the hospital locations were uh, the Walter Reed National Military Cons Consortium at uh, Bethesda, mm -hmm. Portsmouth, Virginia, and then San Diego. Okay. And so I'm like, if I stay on the East Coast, I, I want to do Walter Reed. But if not, I'm like, California. <laughs> San Diego was actually my first choice because I was I gotten to see Walter Reed and Portsmouth. And I was like, if I get to go anywhere, it's like, I've never been. This will be a great opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, and so... So I was fortunate enough to get picked to go to, to San Diego to do my internal medicine internship and then um, went on to, because, you know, like with the, the way the military structure is, everybody does an internship year right. mm -hmm. and you have to reapply whether mm -hmm. uh, for all residents right, and then right. you get selected to do an operational tour, um, which you're basically a general medical officer. So like a, like a general yeah. primary care general mm -hmm. practitioner mm -hmm. and do that for up to two years mm -hmm. uh, before you come back and then complete your residency. Mm -hmm. And then you can choose to do the same residency or go a completely different field. So I could have done an internal medicine internship year, 
then my two years come back and then I'm like, uh, I want to do anesthesia or I want to do dermatology now. Right. I don't want to finish internships. Uh-huh. And so you just kind of pick up from where you left off. Right. Um, which is, is still kind of daunting in a sense because you've been out of like, you know, clinical hospital-based medicine. You've been primary, pretty much functioning as like an urgent care doctor for two years. And then you have right. to go back and matriculate into that system. And right. it's like, you're back to the bottom of the totem pole, uh, <laughs> rounding on patients. And, you know, so it's like, uh, um, I though was able to, me and a, a few of my other internal medicine classmates, we were able to go straight through. So our training right. wasn't interrupted. interrupted. Okay, that's um, good. So you went straight through internal medicine and then you did your fellowship in infectious disease? Yeah. I got picked up for infectious disease as well. So from 2014 to 2017, I did internal medicine. Uh, 2017 to 2019, I did infectious disease all at San Diego. So So in in total, yeah, I got to be there for about five years. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Um, So let me ask you this. I want to end with the fact mentorship. Talk to me about, because I believe, did I meet one of your mentors in infectious disease? Yeah, so you met um, yeah, you met one of my infectious disease mentors, and I actually met her through her? my San Diego mentor. The Charmaine, um, so, what's her last name? Yeah, so Captain Charmaine Beckett. Beckett, okay, so Dr. She, Beckett. So she primarily is an East Coast-based, uh, Navy-based infectious disease doctor. Okay. Um, that also did research, um, <laughs> infectious disease research and, and clinical practice. But she was really good colleagues with my program director in San Diego. Okay, because she calls you one of her superstars. Let me just put yeah. your plug in. She said he is one of uh, our superstars, so that's nice. Uh, so, so tell me about mentorship and, and the power of that. Yeah, so mentorship, uh, it's, it's everything. It's, it's cliche, but you know, like I said earlier, it takes a village. Uh, none, none of us get to where we are by ourselves. That's uh, right. We, we may you know, it may feel like it, but, uh, you know, there's always people there that are kind of like showing you, leading you to path, mm-hmm. either by a good example or a bad example. Mm-hmm. Um, but then if you're fortunate enough to have people that can show you the good example and then kind of give you that guidance along the way. Um, and I was able to uh, have a couple of those. Um, mm-hmm. One, Dr. Ryan Maves, he He's an infectious disease and critical care specialist. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he's actually the one who kind of steered me towards infectious disease. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, it was on a non-infectious disease rotation. It was actually okay. in the ICU. And okay. I was like, yeah, but everyone knew him as the ID doctor. Okay. Uh, he actually became my mentor on a critical care rotation. Mm-hmm. I was like the senior... Uh, medicine resident in the ICU and it's like we got close through that through my time there in the ICU because I Mm -hmm. thought I wanted to do that at one point but Mm -hmm. then I ended up following his footsteps on the other side to do Mm -hmm. ID oh wow uh, it it was just one of those things where you know he led by example and I was like if I can be the the type of physician and Mm -hmm. just person I want to try to emulate and model that type of behavior um what's his name again uh Ryan Ryan Mays Ryan Mays, and he is a black physician. Uh, I know, so he's actually white. Oh, wonderful! And so, yeah. so, you know, someone said your mentors don't have to be, don't have to look like you, but they can yeah. relate and bring you into your their exactly. goals. So that's important it's, to know. Mindset, exactly. Yeah, uh, I, I did have other, like uh, one of my other really good mentors was an African American doctor, uh, but Obi Gan. So he mm-hmm. was good and, and great from uh, just Navy medicine. Um, you know, this is what it's like to be a African American officer in the Navy in a you right. know an environment where the only other people that you see that look like you, mm-hmm. you know, um, are either black nurses or they're black enlisted, but there yes. weren't many black officer figures. All right. Mm-hmm. So uh, he kind of helped me navigate just being a a young black resident in a you know predominantly um, um, non black environment. Correct. But I also felt like I got a lot of going to University of Georgia, growing up in South Carolina. I'm like, <laughs> kind of been groomed towards that my whole life. It's like, okay. <laughs> Wanted to be a genetics major. Trust and yeah. believe you were there by yourself. For better or for worse. <laughs> uh, you know, it's like I'd already kind of filtered. I always screen out of being around a lot of African-Americans, even from right. my early, you know, when 
we had what uh, gifted and talented honors. And so the few of us that screened out early on, mm -hmm. we already got separated from our black friends and colleagues right, uh, right. early on in school. And so that was kind of the, the norm. Um, and it, it, it's interesting because it, uh, my uncle, one of my uncles didn't go to school, but he was like, everybody that looks like us ain't for us. I understand. And, and he was like, yeah, you'll, you know, just because they're black don't mean that, yeah, you should go follow them as your mentor. And just because they're not black doesn't mean that you shouldn't give them a chance. Correct. Um, right. Just, so that's kind of, and so looking mm -hmm. at it, the, the racial, the, just having a cultural appreciation, I think is matters a lot. Like, yeah, they may not oh. look like me, but if they can appreciate and respect mm -hmm. um, my struggle, mm -hmm. um, then, mm -hmm. You know, it, it it comes off more genuine versus it's right. like just not acknowledging like, oh yeah, it's hard for you. It's like, nah, it's like, yeah, we get it. We know it's rough. It's hard. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that that too. You know what I want to appreciate, even though you say you know we get we get selected out and we're like the smart black kid. The, the problem, is, the the thing is, like you 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 made friends with my cousin. You know what I'm saying? And so mm -hmm. it's kind of like you know, just because you get selected out. Um, doesn't mean that when you're walking around and you see that other dude over there and, you know, my cousin is not, he, you, you don't miss him. You know, he's a big guy, you know, I call him a gentle giant. And so, you know, so that told me a lot when, when you was like, yeah, you know, Jaroski through college. Yeah, that's my guy. And so, you know, with, when this process happens, that's what we need to, to remember that we still can connect with each other. And we can still vibe, you know, even though I got to go to this genetics department, you know, I'll, I'll talk to you later, you know, and get, so, so that's what's so sweet about it. When you can come into the fold, even though you got to leave the fold at some time. So that's, that's yeah. cool. And uh, it's funny that you mentioned that too. It made me think back because <laughs> uh, we met in the computer science building because he was computer science. <laughs> at some science uh -huh. I feel like all the black, young black dudes at some point in 2000, <laughs> Like yeah, you're trying to get that money. <laughs> or computer science. That, that, that's what was booming. That's uh -huh. what they're like. You go to school, you song with computers. Yeah, uh, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and, he can, and he knows how to do all that stuff, too. Yeah, um, yeah. I was like the same. That's yeah. cool. So, um, but the power of mentorship is, is everything, particularly when you um, are first generation. Uh, you know, we come from small towns. I think out of my small town, my dad and uh, there's another family in town. Um, that um, produced the doctor, so they're so proud, you know. Uh, and it's and 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 people will not believe unless we show them where we're from. Seriously, you know. Um, and when I go back now, I think like, how did we, you know, how did we do it? You know, I went to Summertown Elementary School. You know what I'm saying? And uh, we did leave and go to Houston. Um, but the fact is that in this town. Uh, that has produced another doctor, it, it's been done, you know, and I'm sure there'll be other kids from these rural communities that, you know, go into medicine or beyond. Uh, but if we were to show you where we grew up, you would be like, nah, <laughs> you know, the, our schools did not have bells and whistles. There was, you know, it, we didn't have yeah. it. <laughs> and, uh, it's, you're right, public schools. And I'm like, I'm a product of public schools, but- oh, Public rural school, okay? Rural. That's yeah. rural. Even, yeah, yeah. I feel like public rural, public inner city, uh, yes. you know, not a lot of funding. Right. God, but some, somehow, you know, not even somehow, grace of God, mm -hmm. family. Uh, and teachers, my teachers, I still remember my third grade teacher, yeah. Ms. Brown. I mean, she was- yeah. And, it, and it, that's what I mean. It's something else that must be taking place to give kids who are significantly disadvantaged um, the confidence to go out into these environments and, and, uh, and know that you can be successful. I mean, it's just, there has to be some, some kind, something else holding us up because then because because it's stacked against us. It really is stacked against us. Yeah. And, it, you know, we had to work through college. You know, we're tackling difficult majors. We know we want to be doctors. We have to hear discouragement, create another plan, and get there. <laughs> I mean, that's that's my summary. <laughs> yeah, it, it is. And I think just like like you said, just that where our our families came from and those backgrounds, mm -hmm. and just like their resiliency kind of got passed down to us. I know there's not a resiliency trait, 
but uh, <laughs> are you sure? <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like we get some. Uh, some of it's definitely passed down to us, but then mm -hmm. the environments and the experiences that we go through, kind of, you know, they they all help shape and mold us into. Well, I may not get it the first time around, but I'm mm -hmm. not gonna quit. Um, not gonna quit. But at the same time, having that <laughs> wisdom to know it's like, okay, I've done this like 20 times now. Maybe it's not. Maybe this isn't for me. And mm -hmm. then just knowing not not when to quit, but when to pivot. And it's like, okay, pivot. this is what I thought was for me. Mm -hmm. Was was this truly for me? Was I trying to make somebody else proud, or you know, you follow do have their to, yeah, uh, and and kind of finding and pivoting into what is it, what is theirs? Because uh, you know, we all have the some of us have the passion for it, but not the competency for it. Understand. We might have the competency for it. And not, not the be passion, like, not the I'm passion. Like, yeah, love science, love math, but I don't like people. It's like, well, you <laughs> or you may just need to do pathology or radiology, you know, or something. Yes, um, exactly. And, and so it it, takes all, and we're looking for all. We're looking for lawyers. We're looking for PhDs. We're looking for educators. Um, we're looking, you know. So there is no, there is room for all of us at the top in terms. And I tell you know students, just strive for excellence. You know, yeah. if you, you want to be a political scientist, be just be the best. I mean, if you want to be an engineer, be the best. I have a, a, a nephew that's going off into education, special education teacher, and he is on an open highway now. So he's like, auntie, I, 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 I accomplished my goal of, uh, you know, getting you know, in this department. You know, I did uh, for, um, in a year and a half. You know what I'm saying? So he's just amazed at how fast he's on this educational highway. I said, it's for you. It's, it's for you. And you know? even from, um, like you said, it's the the white collar side and even the blue collar side uh, yeah. with teaching the skills that you need to, um, you know, be your own boss. And it's like, well, I'm a plumber, but I can, you know, use and work with my hands. Right. And now turn that into my own business uh, or, you know, and take these skills and family, family trades that get passed down and passed down. But now mm -hmm. you're the generation to put the, Elevated. Know, the the business sense with it and become an entrepreneur based off of this skill with you working right. with your hands. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that was one of the, the lessons of my family early on because everybody's blue collar. They work with their hands. Right. But I think the piece where we didn't have is like, well, instead of working hard for somebody else, how can you work? Correct. They, we never, they never found a way to make that transition to work hard for themselves to kind of build that wealth uh generational wealth for themselves it's like yeah we can work in somebody else's factory but why not start our own business and factory correct um, mm -hmm. and i think hopefully our generation uh me and jaroski talk about this a lot but you know kind of setting setting up the next generation so that you know they can just take it a, a step further right um, we would always say this one thing to me well we were uh we're like the vanderbilts and the carnegies it's like they taught people, they taught people at our level vocations. It's like, mm -hmm. they'll teach you what it takes to run their business, but right. they won't teach you what it takes to be the business or, or, or own the business. Correct. So it's like, oh, it's like, yeah, they teach us. And so it's like a lot of, you know, when we're talking, he's like, yeah, they'll teach us trades and this and how to do this. But it's like, mm -hmm. nobody teaches you how to be an entrepreneur because that's how you get rich and wealthy. You that's don't correct. get rich and wealthy working hard for, for the Carnegie's and the Vanderbilt's. You, mm -hmm. you get wealthy by being them. And yes. it's like, they could easily teach that, but nobody teaches, you know, that to us. We got to learn this on ourselves. Um, right. And, that, and, so, and yeah, that, that's why. That, uh, you know, that's what I tell medical students too. And I let, let uh, that once you get out of medical school, uh, you got to learn the business of medicine. And so you are in a uh, military environment. Um, you have your assignment and, and thank you for your service. Let me say that. Thank you for your service and you have done your family and your, your, your uh, ancestors proud and you're doing the nation uh, a great service. And we'll talk more about uh, your time in Ghana. I'm very interested in hearing about uh, your time in Ghana and helping them with the COVID uh, uh, pandemic. Uh, but I will say that I tell students who are in the civilian practice that you know, your first year out, you're going to learn about the business model of medicine. And so you're right. You learn to take the test to get into medical school. You get, you survive and, and thrive in medical school. And then you're going to enter another world uh, of business and you have to be ready for that. 
And sometimes we are not, particularly as minority students, uh, ready for that aspect. And then we got to kind of negotiate contracts, salaries, and also, uh, like you said earlier, and didn't expound on, but, you know, our families need us. Okay. And we want to be there for them as well. So, so much to talk about. I'm not going to take all your evening. Okay. <laughs> and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll check back in with each other. Okay, Dr. Sanders. Definitely. Well, thank, thank you for having me. I, I appreciate it. Jaroski, I can finally tell him that we talk. <laughs> <laughs> All right, a little quiet, gentle cousin. All right, my friend, we'll talk. All right, dog, you have a good night. You too, bye-bye. Bye. Hi, you Zima family. If you like what you're seeing and what you're hearing, subscribe to our channel. Hit the bell icon below to be notified of our recent videos. What the doctor say?